Hi everyone, welcome to the University of Southern California's uh, Viterbi School of Engineering um, admitted student webinar today for uh, the master's in quantum information science. Um, we'll just give everyone just a minute to log in, but it looks like um, many of you are here. So we'll just go ahead and, and get started in just about a minute. So if you could please stand by and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So we've got um, yeah, most of us that are registered are here. So I'm so happy to see everyone joining us today. Um, my name is Cami. I represent the Viterbi School of Engineering um, graduate programs. Um, and I am really pleased to welcome all of you today. And congratulations on your admission um, to the Master's in Quantum Information Science. Um, today, we have um, Dr. Todd Brunn and um, Dr. George Ingersoll um, from the Viterbi School of Engineering and from the Dornsife Seif College, um, respectively. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just give kind of a brief um, introduction, and then I'll turn it over to our professors. Um, and so if you can just kind of uh, bear with me here, um, there's going to be just a few things I'll cover. If you can go ahead and um, use the Q&A function if you have any questions. Thank you very much for um, my colleague, Ray, um, who, have who has just put that information into the chat. So um, the Q&A section um, is the best uh, place to be able to put your questions, um, and then we can address them uh, accordingly. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome um, to, to USC, and we're so pleased that you're considering um, the, the program here to pursue your graduate studies. Just a few things. Um, give me one minute here. Uh, just a few things about the School of Engineering. We've got about six, uh, 6,300 graduate students. Um, that's master's and PhD. That includes master's students who are taking our program remotely. Um, so we have a good um, uh, dynamic population um, of graduate students. Uh, we have 17 full-time tenure-track National Academy of Engineering men, uh, members. We're ranked number 12 um, in graduate engineering programs by US uh, News and World Report. And you'll find over 76,000 engineering alumni worldwide. Um, one of the nice things is um, for myself, I've been able to meet so many alumni um, as I have been able to travel and meet students from all over the world. Um, I have been able to um, see and meet many alumni that are um, living um, in various parts of the globe. So it's been really nice to be able to see our alumni um, successful and moving all across um, the country and the world. Okay. Okay, so for those of you who have not necessarily been to Los Angeles or maybe have visited um, or have just heard about Los Angeles, just um, uh, one thing to kind of touch upon with um, regards to our location. Um, one of the, the best things about our location is um, being a global hub for innovation. And you'll see here in this kind of small map, um, Los Angeles, the greater Los Angeles area, and where USC is located, we're very centrally located um, to be able to access the wealth of resources that we have here in Los Angeles. Um, you'll see in kind of the west side, you know, where the blue is, that's the water. Um, you'll see kind of the um, a lot of development there in terms of um, of innovation. A lot of um, technical companies have have um, developed uh, spaces there. And so you can kind of see that it's um, a great opportunity to study in Los Angeles and provides a lot of opportunities for internships and future careers. Okay, so I'll just touch on this really quickly. We um, here at the uh, university, 
We have students from one, over 110 countries that um, attend the university. Um, in the engineering school alone, we have applicants from over 70 countries. And so one of the great things about the university, if that's something uh, uh, you're looking for um, as you pursue your graduate studies, is that we have a very global community, um, a very dynamic and diverse community. And that's what I think is one of the, the greatest assets of, of the school is that you're really able to meet people um, with really diverse and um, varied backgrounds and learn from professors, of course, that are also um, have varied backgrounds as well. So that's one thing that's I, I find a, a great asset about the school. Um, one thing um, that we have been able to do is to uh, implement uh, our ambassador program, which uh, I'm really happy about because I do know that as you're kind of making your decision, it's really um, valuable to be able to talk to students that are currently enrolled at USC. Um, obviously, I um, work at the university and of course I am very biased because I, I know how wonderful the, the school is, but hearing from um, students is, is really important. So. We have an ambassador program, which you can use to contact students um, and just ask them any questions. And they are really responsive and, and great about um, uh, just sharing their experiences with you. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, a few other things too, as um, you explore, many of you um, may be um, residing outside of California and outside of the country. So please do feel free to take um, advantage of some of these resources like taking a virtual tour of campus, um, exploring the student organizations and the cultural communities. I think that's really important because um, uh, of course, as you're coming here to, to pursue your graduate program, you want to enjoy yourself also and meet people and network with others. So that's a really great way to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> learn about student safety and wellness. That's a really important um, uh, thing for us here at U USC is just to be able to, of course, um, know that you're, you're um, uh, safe and that the university um, has a lot of programs to ensure your safety and then just ensuring your wellness as well because many of you may be coming from a different um, state or city or country. So that's very important to us. And then for international students, we have a dedicated international student um, office for you to, um, to access in, in case you have any um, questions about um, immigration um, issues, visa issues, things like that. Okay, the fall deadlines. Um, so for students who are um, international students, um, you have until April the 15th to submit um, financial documents and just your um, statement of, of financial support. Um, May 1st is the last day to submit your statement of intent and your commitment deposit. So um, please be mindful of those deadlines um, and those are fast approaching. So we hope that you, you can meet those and that we hope to welcome you here. And then uh, many students, um, we know that over the years, students usually wait until you know, the day before the deadline or on the deadline to, um, to commit um, if they are intending to enroll here. Um, but the sooner you do that, um, the sooner that you can access pre-orientation resources, join a mentorship program, connect with your department. A lot of your the academic departments start to reach out to you um, to kind of uh, uh, request what your course plans are and, and things like that. So it's really important um, um, uh, to kind of uh, submit your statement of intent. If you already know that you um, are planning to come here, um, the advisors will start reaching out to you um, sooner than that. And then explore housing options as well. That's really important as well. Okay, so here's our contact information. And then we'll of course share these slides with you as well um, after the, the session. Um, but you can always contact us if you have further questions um, uh, just uh, related to um, anything related to your admission. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to um, our friend, Dr. Todd Brun, who will kind of talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, Masters in Quantum Information Science and specifically about the program. Okay, so there you go, Todd. Thanks. So I'm gonna share some slides. So thanks a lot, Cami. Um, uh, so I'm going to give a very brief presentation about the master's program itself, and uh, also about the the motivation behind creating this program, which is still quite new. Our first cohort of students uh, came in, in last fall, fall of 2021. Um, so so we've 
the group of you that we're talking to now would be um, in the second cohort of students to join this program. Um, and uh, I'll present this and then George, you can chime in if you wanna add anything to that and then we'll field your questions. All right, so uh, I think all of you probably know this based on your interest in the program in the first place, but um, quantum information science is, is a rapidly growing field. The field really originated in the 1990s, but it's grown um, very fast in the last few years. Um, largely due to two things. One is a, a greatly increased uh, amount of investment from industry and um, uh, the development of the first small quantum processors. Um, so small in quantum sounds redundant, but of course uh, the, the hope is that these can be scaled up over time into machines capable of running um, uh, serious algorithms that are far beyond anything that uh, an ordinary classical computer could do. Uh, there are a number of large companies that have moved into this area. Some of them have been in it for a long time, like IBM has supported people doing research in this area since the very beginning. Um, but now IBM has a, a large hardware program as well, uh, building superconducting super quantum chips. Uh, Google has a, a large effort as well and has uh, notched some really groundbreaking results, um, sort of proofs of principle of uh, what we call a quantum advantage. Um, and then Intel um, is, is also developing a chip. Um, Microsoft um, has moved into the software side of things and also cloud services connecting people to the hardware. Um, and it's not just in this country either, by any means, Alibaba and Tencent are both um, got quantum computing efforts now. One of my former students is helping to organize the quantum computing effort at Tencent, for example. Um, and then there are also a lot of startups. Um, so here's a very abbreviated list of some of them, Ide Quantique, uh, which makes quantum cryptography systems, D-Wave, which is one of the earliest companies to develop. They build special purpose quantum annealing machines. Rigetti, which is also developing superconducting chips. Ion Q, which is using a different technology, uh, ion trap based quantum computing, which is also being worked on by some other companies such as Honeywell. Q Control and Xanadu are developing software uh, for quantum computing and quantum computing research. So, Right now, we're seeing the field moves. Research is still very much um, a major activity, um, but we're moving from, from the earlier situation where pretty much everything was basic research to a phase of commercialization and industrial investment. And that's why we thought that a master's program might be timely uh, to develop at this time, because increasingly, we're going to see the employment in this area move from uh, largely people engaged in research to people um, developing uh, and designing hardware, um, uh, software uh, engineering, and, and a lot of other um, aspects in developing quantum technologies. So, sorry, I'm gonna adjust this because the sun is now shining right in my eyes. Hopefully I'm still visible. Uh, so some of the applications of quantum information science, some of these are things that people are already working on like quantum cryptography. I mentioned Ide Quantique, but there's a number of, uh, which is based in Switzerland, but there are a number of companies, Magic in the United States and others. Um, and uh, one of the near-term goals that people are very focused on is on advanced quantum simulations so quantum computers have a big advantage in simulating quantum systems. So this could have applications in a number of areas, but notably chemistry. You can think chemistry is in a sense applied quantum mechanics. Um, and it's very difficult to do fully quantum simulations with ordinary computers. Another area people that are working on a lot right now is optimization. Um, 
this is an area where uh, exactly what what the regions of advantage are are still being discovered, but um, people are are, um, are trying to apply uh, quantum techniques to a number of different problems. And I mentioned the D-wave machines and other quantum annealing machines, which are designed to solve classes of optimization problems. Uh, a little bit further out, quantum computers can solve large linear systems, much bigger than anything that a classical computer can do, um, though um, this needs to be in a, in a certain regime of uh, parameter space for there to be a real advantage. Um, people are working on uh, both applying quantum computers to problems in machine learning and also applying machine learning techniques to developing better quantum computers. So for instance, some students of mine are working on using machine learning um, for error correction, for diagnosing the errors of quantum codes. Um, something that's sort of still more in the research area is quantum sensing and precision measurement and metrology. In principle, using entangled quantum systems can give you a scaling improvement in the ability to do precision measurements. So this is still in its infancy, but, but it's developing rapidly. And then there are, uh, in addition to cryptography, which I mentioned before, there are potential applications to other areas of of communication. The use of quantum resources could, in principle, boost communication rates um, and also can be used for various kinds of authentication and uh, other cryptographic protocols. So to talk about the growth of industry in this area, I pulled this list off of the website of my colleague, uh, Daniel Ladar, who's also here at USC. Um, he keeps a list of companies that are doing work in this area. You notice I have to make the font really small in order to fit them on this page. And, and yet I have direct evidence that this list is, is already out of date. There, there are a bunch of startups that are not on this list. Now I imagine he's too busy to keep adding them every day. Um, but I got a very dramatic uh, illustration of this when I went to the uh, March meeting of the American Physical Society a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, that always includes an exhibit hall of companies making laboratory equipment and things like that. It was the first in-person meeting uh, of the March meeting since 2019. And it was astonishing how much of the exhibit space was now taken up by various companies working on at different aspects of quantum computing and quantum information. So here are some pictures I took from there. Um, you can see this is a part of a dilution refrigerator, which is used for these superconducting systems um, on display. This company is developing software, uh, promoting uh, um, quantum industries in other countries. Uh, and that was certainly not all. Um, and actually, this isn't even all the photos I took, but it gets boring after a while to look at them all. Um, so, uh, you know, ju judging from these kind of external signs, there really has been an enormous surge of interest in industry towards this. Um, and that's really what the uh, MS program was designed in particular for, but of course it could also serve as a gateway into research. Some of research is being done in these companies where there's also academic research, definitely still ongoing, um, and uh, uh, research at government labs and, and other facilities. Um, so some people who start on a master's program may decide they wanna go on and do research and perhaps get a PhD as well. So the master's program itself, just very briefly. Um, so Cami was talking about the, the School of Engineering, the Viterbi School, and it is administratively run by the School of Engineering and it's centered in the electrical and computer engineering department. Um, but it was actually created as a collaboration between several departments, not just in the School of Engineering, uh, but also in the Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences in particular. 
uh, in the School of Engineering between electrical and computer engineering and some uh, from computer science and in the in the college uh, with physics and with chemistry. Um, so for administrative reasons, it's much easier if it's uh, run by a single department. So that's why it ended up in, in ECE where I have my primary appointment. I'm the faculty advisor for the program. Um, uh, George, did you wanna add something to that? I can't hear you actually, is your mic working? You're, you're unmuted. But... How's this? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, I would only say, I mean, this is one of my favorite things about this program is the collaborative nature of it. And the, I mean, I think speaking, just doubling down on, on what you said and what Cami has said about the diversity of perspectives and opportunities within USC and Los Angeles, it's even more true for a program like this that spans multiple departments. And I mean, just the amount of research in many different areas that is being done both within Viterbi and with Dornsife, particularly the um, Department of Physics and Astronomy, just not only offers so many different ways to collaborate with you know, researchers and doctoral students and other you know, master's students, but also just the, the, this program has always been, you know, the conversation around this has always been around application and ways for people to, to immediately go into industry and apply what they've learned. There is, as you know, you were just mentioning all the different applications of quantum information science. I think that's also sort of reflected in the different things that people are studying and working on in both schools. Very much so, thanks. Um, so the way we conceived the program was that it would be a 28 unit program, which would be generally uh, on the order of, of seven or so classes uh, taken over three semesters, uh, generally admission in the fall, then the following spring semester, and then the, the, the fall semester of the next year. Um, over the summer, one could do um, uh, an internship or possibly be engaged in directed research. Um, it's pre-pandemic was conceived as being for full-time in-person instruction. Um, most classes at USC are currently operating in a hybrid mode. Um, so they are jointly in-person and non-Zoom. I don't know how much that will persist. So it is really intended if things return to normal, whatever that is, that it will be mainly in person. We do have facilities for remote instruction uh, and it's, it may be that we'll move in that direction in the future, but, but for now, that's, that's the goal. There's an emphasis both on the, on the theory of quantum information science, but also on practical applications. So some of our courses are for um, uh, programming quantum computers or, or doing projects in quantum computation. So there's very few such master's programs right now. We're one of the first to be created. A few years from now, maybe that'll change. Seems like others have started deciding this is a good idea. But for now, that's still true. And uh, if you want the details of the requirements, uh, the USC course catalog is online. Um, here's the URL, but it's easy to find on the USC website. And it will give the exact requirements of the class. Um, so I think we said most of this anyway, but it, it, it includes both introductions to the theory of quantum computing and quantum information and some work on, on, uh, on projects of uh, programming quantum computers. Um, uh, basically, we break it down into uh, a set of three classes that we're requiring people to take, which cover sort of a broad introduction to quantum information processing. This is a class EE520. Um, quantum error correction, which is a class EE514. And applications of quantum computing, which is in the physics department, physics 513. Then one has to choose a sample of classes from a, a, a somewhat longer list which I hope will become even longer with time. There are a couple of classes that I'm hoping we're gonna add over the next couple of years. One on quantum cryptography, 
uh, that was offered as a special topics class last year. This fall, there's a, a special topics class being offered uh, in quantum fault tolerance, developing fault tolerant quantum computers taught by my colleague, uh, Ben Reichardt. Um, and I hope that both of these will become regular classes. Um, uh, but for now, we can also approve them to count towards the degree. And then you can take electives in related areas like algorithms in the computer science department. Or if you come in, say, from a computer science background and you'd like to take a quantum mechanics class, either in ECE or in physics, you can do that. And, um, you know, there's a long list of, of possible electives and we can approve others as well. So here's a, an example of what a, what a, a schedule might look like uh, for this degree. Um, you start with an introduction to quantum information processing and say maybe one of the elective classes. Then in the spring, you might take uh, physics 513, which is applications of quantum computing. I mentioned that's one of the required classes and maybe one of our core classes, Open Quantum Systems. Um, there's another one that I've been teaching right now, which is um, on quantum information theory, about the theory of quantum communication. Um, and then in the, in the last uh, semester, pick up uh, the quantum error correction class. Obviously, the order is, is not set. And then we, we try to tailor this. There are, uh, we hope, enough options to, to tailor this to people with different backgrounds. So some people will come in with a physics background, some with an uh, engineering background or a computer science background, or perhaps another field like chemistry or mathematics. Um, so I think anyone from, from a, a a background with good mathematical skills could um, come into this program and succeed. So uh, these are the contacts for me, for, for George, and for Cami, um, which uh, hopefully you'll feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And, um, and then we'll, we'll devote the rest of this to questions now. But George, do you want to add something before we get to that? No, let's take the questions. Yeah. Okay, it looks like there's one question here um, who's asking, is it possible for master of computer science students to do research in quantum computing? I would love to explore quantum information from a CS and a math perspective. Yes, so um, quantum information science is a very multidisciplinary area. And when the field was coming together in the 1990s, one of the really exciting things about it was that people were, were coming, bringing ideas from, from a number of different fields. So physics, obviously, um, uh, the, the quantum theory and, and the uh, mathematical apparatus of that, we use notation like Dirac notation that derives from physics. Um, but computer science was one of the major components. And in fact, what really launched the whole field was in 1994, the discovery by Peter Shore of the algorithm for um, uh, factoring large integers, which has implications for crypt cryptography, public key cryptography. So he's a mathematician and a computer scientist. He was at um, uh, AT&T research at that time, and he's now in the math department at MIT. Um, and a lot of the developments of algorithms and our understanding of computational complexity for quantum computers, which differs quite significantly from complexity of classical computers, that all comes out of computer science. Um, now, one of the one of the effects of this interdisciplinarity is that we all have to learn other stuff. So I'm a physicist by background, um, but I've had to learn an awful lot of computer science in order to work in this field. And other things, I've had to learn information theory, which is usually taught in electrical engineering departments. And I've had to learn about um, um, uh, NMR, um, which, which is, usually part of chemistry um, and about uh, 
uh, error correction and and uh, uh, other other aspects uh, of of different disciplines. So the classes that the specifically quantum information classes that we teach do draw on these different backgrounds, and we try to make them as self-contained as we can, so that people, for instance, uh, even if you've never taken a quantum mechanics class, you can take EE520. You may have to work a little more to master the quantum mechanics part of it, but we start with an introduction to the elements of quantum mechanics that you need for this field. Um, so yeah, we can, we can, and we we do take people from a variety of different backgrounds. And there's also real potential for work in different areas. So people de developing. Uh, programming methods for quantum computers from the computer science background, um, people figuring out how to, as we scale up to larger sizes, to do architecture of quantum computers um, from, you know, the kind of com computer architecture, VLSI and so forth backgrounds, and, um, and of course, physics. Um, yeah, so that was a long answer to a brief question, but hopefully that gives you some idea. Thank you so much. And um, there's a question here. What's the cohort size of the classes in the program? I can't imagine they're very large at this point since the program is relatively um, new, but um, somebody wants to know about the average class size. Yeah. So as far as the cohort size, the first cohort has nine students. In it. Um, now, the class size is a bit larger than that because it includes not only students in the MSQIS program, but PhD students who are working in this area and some other master students in other programs who are interested in, in the area, but you know, um, are, are getting degrees, sort of more traditional degrees, let's say. So we have some a master's students from uh, ECE in particular, but we, we get them also from computer science and, and other departments. So for instance, the quantum information class I'm teaching right now has 20 students in it. Um, and that is about, uh, let's see, I think six or seven of them are MSQIS, MSQIS students. I should have checked that before this, but I think that's about maybe six of them and the rest are a mix of PhD students and MS students from other programs. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I don't know if you know offhand um, where some of the um, our current students were able to get internships um, this year. If that was, I, I don't know directly. Yeah, uh, um, there a lot of companies are offering internships. I should ask them um, what what they're doing this summer. Uh, so another thing that really struck me both at the March meeting that I was at a few weeks ago and actually another conference just the week before called QIP, which is a specifically quantum conference, the people from the companies were all saying, we're hiring. You know, everyone, every time they gave a talk, they would end with, and by the way, we're hiring. Um, so some of that is for people with PhDs, um, but, but some of it is, is broader hiring as well. Uh, so I know that um, there are internship programs at most of the major companies I listed, Microsoft, Google, um, IBM, uh, and uh, yeah, Intel, Honeywell. Um, so, uh, but I don't know what our, our current students are doing. There's also a lot of startups and that can actually be a kind of exciting environment. A, a current PhD student here at USC uh, I didn't ask her, but I, I don't think she'll mind. Uh, her name is Amy Brown. She's now a PhD student in physics. Um, straight out of her bachelor's, she went to work for Rigetti, who are one of the startups developing superconducting quantum processors uh, up in the Bay Area. And uh, she worked for them for several years and then decided to go and get a PhD. But ironically, she came down to USC to give a kind of a seminar to teach us how to use the Rigetti machines down here. So she was teaching classes to the students and professors down here. And now she's back here as a student herself. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there certainly are opportunities in, in, in a lot of these startups as well. There are several of them in the LA area, but there's also 
you know, other places. So Google has a facility in the LA area. Uh, Q Control, who's a software startup, they're uh, Australia based, but they have an office in LA now. Um, uh, uh, in Santa Barbara, Microsoft has a has a center there. Um, and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure where people are working right now. Sorry. I also can't offer any in, in, insight into where the folks who will be starting their internships this summer will be. But I, I do remember in as when we were doing our research for launching this program um, into job opportunities related to, to this field, just how many internships were being posted. It's really, um, that was the overwhelming takeaway was just companies are looking for interns. Yeah, they, uh, on the company websites, usually if you go either to their employment page or sometimes they have a separate internship page, they list them there. And then we can certainly after this um, uh, get a um, get in contact with the students in the program and, and just kind of do a quick um, survey of them and see if any of them are yeah we are interning. Can do that yeah um, okay there's a question here um, can we take the electives outside of the prescribed uh, catalog and list um, from different departments. So yes, at least up to a point. Um, so we created a list of things that we thought people were likely to want to take that seemed appropriate to us. It's a fairly long list. So those are all pre-approved electives, which means that you can just take them. You can register for those. You don't need permission of any kind. If you want to take another elective, which is not on that list, um, what you do is you submit a, uh, an online form called a special request form. Uh, which is through the website on the ECE department website. Um, and that goes actually to me, um, you know, saying what class you want to uh, take. And, uh, you know, if it seems, you know, reasonably related to quantum information science, then I'll approve it. Um, it's, as I said, a very interdisciplinary field. So I approve all kinds, you know, I'm, I'm open to approving all kinds of things, you know, in computer science, engineering, physics, other areas of science. Um, you know, obviously there are some limits, French romantic poetry, probably not so much, but, um, uh, but yeah, definitely we, we are open to other electives as well. And for the core classes, that list is, you know, we, I'll, I'll sometimes approve things to count as a core class as well. So for instance, that special topics class I mentioned on quantum cryptography, I approved that to count as one of the core classes, one of the list of things where you have to take two classes off of it. Uh, and we'll have another one of those opportunities in the fall, which is uh, this class on uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. Great, thank you. Um, I'll answer this question very quickly. Um, somebody is asking if students are permitted to complete the program on a part-time basis for some or all semesters. So um, that will depend on whether you're um, a U.S. citizen or an international student, because if you're an international student, you do need to keep a certain number of units um, to maintain your visa. Um, but if you are a U.S. citizen, um, then definitely you can kind of take those courses um, uh, on a part-time basis if you wish. Okay, um, so um, there is another question here that probably Professor Brun would be um, best to answer. I'm wondering about the balance in coverage between hardware and software in the program. Is there more emphasis on one over the other? So at the moment, um, there's more theory and software than hardware aspects of it. We have one class, um, which is physics, I'm forgetting the number, it's quantum devices, um, which is very hardware focused. It's taught by Eli Levinson Falk in the physics department, who um, is uh, a, an experimentalist who works on superconducting devices. Um, and it's that's got a kind of hardware focus, though of course it teaches the theory of things as well. Um, in at least uh, a few of the classes. So in EE 520, um, I have a project as part of that, at least when I teach it, um, which I will be teaching it in the fall. Um, 
and uh, that has that could be either theory or or anything. But uh, over time, as the quantum processors have become available through the cloud, um, you know, we are increasingly seeing people running stuff on machines. So we've had people run stuff on the D-Wave machine, which is based here at USC at the Information Sciences Institute. I don't know if you remember that map that Cami showed, but it's down near the, the ocean um, in, in LA, in uh, um, Marina del Rey. Um, and uh, uh, also at, we got access to, well, IBM makes their processors available over the web. We got access to the Rigetti processors. Um, there's also now a couple of cloud services that can give you access to uh, a bunch of different uh, quantum devices. So AWS run by Amazon has that and Microsoft just started their own cloud server um, program as well. Um, so you can get access through that to uh, the machines at IonQ and um, uh, maybe Honeywell's machine as well, I think. Um, and I don't remember if Intel is part of that program or, or not. Uh, so in, in, in 520, um, those that can include programming and running things on an actual quantum computer. In 513, which is applications of quantum physics, 513, which is applications of, of quantum processes, uh, applications of quantum computing, sorry. Um, there's a project for that as well, which involves running things on quantum computers. In 514, which is uh, EE 514, which is uh, quantum error correction, there's also a project there that has tended to generally be a theoretical project. And you can do a theoretical project in 520 as well, if that's your inclination. Um, these can be original work or, um, you know, sort of reading research projects or, or um, programming projects. So those certainly give you some access to hardware, but most of the classes are kind of the more on the theory side of things. Um, that's good. Hardware is limited right now and availability is, is limited as well. Um, and uh, it's, it requires serious facilities to, to build these things. So there's not much opportunity for real hands-on working with them right now, though. Uh, it, and in, if you got an internship at one of these companies like Google, it's possible you might get the opportunity to do that. That would, I think that would be very exciting. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think that there was a follow up question kind of to one of the earlier um, uh, questions. I think it was the first question about, uh, for, about computer science and uh, doing, doing research. Yes, thanks. It's hard um, to tell everyone's anonymous. <laughs> um, the, there was a follow-up question just about what um, are, uh, is the ongoing research in this area um, at USC. Oh, at USC. Um, yeah. So, well, there are, let's see, how many of us are there? There, there are on the order of, yeah, George? I was just going to say, I think this was specific to uh, exploring co uh, complexity in, in quantum computing, um, not, is it not sort of all the things going on at USC oh. in the field of quantum information science. Right. Uh, so right now, um, the, the research at USC in quantum computing is mainly centered in um, the ECE and physics departments and a bit in chemistry. Uh, there are there's one there are two current faculty members in computer science who do some quantum related stuff, uh, Ichiro Nakano and uh, Ming De Huang, um, uh, and certainly Ming De Huang is creating a class a class about that includes some stuff about quantum complexity. I teach uh, so I, I mean I'm talking about computational complexity. I teach a bit of that in EE520, a sort of baby version of it. Um, but uh, I don't think, except possibly Ming Dei, that anyone is, is currently doing research at USC in complexity theory, the kind of thing that Scott Aronson does at UT Austin or, or other people. However, 
Um, I do know that computer science has recently interviewed two candidates um, uh, who are working in, in areas. One of them is working on, on specifically the issue of programming of quantum computers. And the other one is actually one of Scott Aronson's former PhD students whose work is exactly in, in complexity theory. So I don't know what's gonna come of that. We interview lots of people and not all of them get offers and not all of them come. So, uh, but that potentially there, there could be more research in that area in, in the future. Um, I think you're muted, Cam. Sorry, there's another question here. Um, would the courses be specific to any particular approach to quantum computing, like annealing, or would it be generic and platform blind? Well, mostly we, we uh, use the, the so-called circuit model of quantum computing because that's what's most widespread in, in the field. Um, the, um, so, so, so the vast majority of what I do in E520 more or less is on this, using the circuit model. So you can relate that to, I don't know how far into the weeds to go here. You, you can relate that to notions of complexity uh, using uh, the idea of Turing machines. So, so the idea, um, a specific quantum computation is described by some logic circuit. Um, uh, obviously for every different instance of the problem, this circuit will be a bit different. So we call up a problem tractable if these circuits are of polynomial size. And if there's a, uh, uh, in principle, a, a classical Turing machine that if you say, I wanna solve this problem, it will output the circuit you need need to implement. So that's mostly what we teach. Um, and that's the dominant paradigm in the field. It's the paradigm for which we have strong results about error correction and fault tolerance. Um, there are other approaches. So you mentioned annealing in principle. Um, so annealing is, is a generalization of something called adiabatic quantum computing, which has been proven to be universal, but not fault tolerant necessarily. Uh, and it, it requires going up a bit beyond what we know how to do to do universal quantum computing in that model. But, you know, it can be used to solve optimization problems. So that is covered in some classes. I think there's a bit of that in EE 514 and also in physics 550 and actually also in physics 513, I believe. We cover that a bit. Um, there's also some non-computing stuff aspects. So uh, quantum information theory is really about communications, not computing. Um, quantum error correction applies to both computing and communications. Um, and uh, let's see, any other models? I mean, we talk a bit about some of the other models uh, just so you have a kind of idea. So things like holonomic quantum computing and uh, topological, um, but, but it's mainly the circuit model. Great. Um, I'm gonna give Professor Brun a couple minute break right now and I'll answer this question. Um, so it's written on the Viterbi website that 28 credit courses run for four semesters. Um, and how is this program completed in three semesters and what's the credit division? So I'll just kind of answer that question broadly. So generally speaking, we kind of don't recommend that students take um, three courses per semester because that is a pretty heavy load. Many students can do it, but you can kind of see um, what your pace and what your um, ability is. Um, we try not to kind of encourage people to, I, I, while I, we know that sometimes students want to finish the program a little faster, you also want to be mindful of your performance in the program and just kind of not overwhelming yourself with too many classes per semester. So that um, reference that you indicated with taking the four units, then eight, eight, and eight, um, that's kind of what we have seen as kind of a good um, uh, path for students, but you know, you will adjust it um, as you see fit. So if you're really intent on completing it in three semesters, you know, there's no, um, 
uh, policy that we will prevent you from doing that, but you want to be kind of mindful of the balance of, um, you know, performing well in the class and also um, kind of completing it on time. So we kind of um, try to give you that four semesters, lots of times in that summer between the, the four semesters, um, you know, many students will, will work or take an internship. So that's kind of how we've um, determined that. But should you decide um, sometimes students do finish early, maybe one semester you do want to take three courses, um, that's certainly up to you. So that's very possible. Okay. I'll, I'll just add one thing to that, which is um, some students choose to take classes in the summer rather than to do an internship or, or take a job. Now, the, the, the main quantum classes are not offered in the summer, but some of the elective classes are, and there's also the possibility of directed research which can be done for credit. So if you, and I know some people in submitting their original questions asked about research. So directed research is available. It counts as a class. You can do it for differing numbers of units. Um, it requires, of course, the supervision of a faculty member. So a, a good thing to do if you were interested in that, whether in the summer or not, is to, you know, after you've taken a class approach one of your professors, but you can reach out to other people that you haven't taken classes for. And, uh, and that can count towards your elective um, requirements uh, for this degree. Uh, and that's certainly something that can be done in the summer as well. If you would rather do that than do an internship, you know, you could do a research project over the summer, up to say four units, which would count like one, one class. That's a great point. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next question is, um, what are some of the programming languages used throughout the course? And more broadly, is there a sense of what languages are used in the field? Uh, hmm. Well, um, I know a lot of the cloud-based services are based, uh, they use Jupyter notebooks to, so I think both AWS and maybe uh, IBM you use that. So for programming quantum computers, there are actually uh, specific programming languages for that that have been developed. So IBM has their own language slash programming environment called Qiskit. Um, uh, Microsoft has another one, it used to be called Liquid. Uh, the rule is it has to have a Q in the name no matter what, because you know, quantum. Um, but it, but now they're calling it something else, and I, I'm blanking on on what that name is now. Um, so within the the classes that we teach, I don't think there's any prescribed programming language. Certainly, for any programming involved in the classes I teach, people can work in whatever language they want. Um, so I don't I don't know that there's a specific standard. Um, uh, yeah, most people are familiar with, um, you know, one of the common languages, uh, Python or, um, uh, who knows I'm, I'm old, right. I used to program in, I, I literally programmed in Fortran back, back in the day, but, you know, C plus plus and Lisp, anyone remember that one? And, um, you know, so there's all kind. Uh, I don't think we have a a requirement of a particular programming language, um, uh, but but I think for the cloud-based stuff, you would use one of the the uh, one one of the systems that's been developed by by one of these companies, probably either Qiskit or um, or the one that that Microsoft developed, that, whose name I'm blanking on. Thank you. So we've just about um, got about seven minutes left and there's two questions remaining. So um, I know Professor Brun, you talked about directed research. Um, but there is a question here about the thesis option and just exploring research in QIS at the CQ. Yeah, so a couple of people ask about the thesis option also in the questions they submitted. So, um, so right now we don't have a thesis option for this program. Um, now, uh, maybe, that will change in the future, but for the present, there's not. Um, so in engineering, uh, many of the master's programs don't 
I mean, many of them have thesis options in principle that they're actually rarely exercised. Um, uh, however, research is definitely possible and indeed encouraged. Um, so that's done as what we call directed research. So it's um, you apply for it with a particular faculty member who supervises it. Um, and this can be in any of several departments, depending on the department where the faculty member is. We approve all of that for, for this program. Um, and this research can and often does lead to published uh, research uh, work, either within the, um, you know, the, the semester that it's done, or sometimes it takes a while for it to actually make its way into, uh, uh, into a journal. Uh, but also might involve, for you know, instance, presentations at conferences or something like that. So I've had students who do who do that. Um, for the present, we we didn't include a thesis option for this master's degree. And so unless there's something broader, so Cami, you might be able to offer this. But I think it's program by program, right? Whether they offer it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for now, we don't. Okay. Thank you. And then last but not least, um, is there something we can touch up on during the time we have before classes start so that we are best prepared? I like that question. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I, I will say this field is pretty mathematical. Um, so you really need to be comfortable with that. And the, the area of mathematics that is most central to it is linear algebra. So the theory of you know, vectors, matrices, vector spaces, uh, linear transformations and, and so forth. So brushing up on that and quantum mechanics, it's all complex linear algebra, it's complex numbers. So quantum, um, quantum mechanics, if you've taken a standard quantum mechanics class, you probably spend a lot of time solving the Schrodinger equation, which is a differential equation. So we do a bit of that, but actually in quantum information theory, uh, the emphasis is kind of different. Um, it's mostly finite dimensional systems, discrete systems, uh, and discrete time. So rather than solving things evolving continuously in time, it's like computational steps where you go from the state at step one to the state at step two, which is your states are vectors that are multiplied by matrices. So linear algebra, number one. Um, and uh, if you have access to the book Nielsen and Schwang, uh, sorry, that's the authors of the book, it's Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by um, Michael Nielsen and Isaac Schwang, uh, still kind of the Bible of the field, even though it's more than 20 years old now. Um, they have an introductory chapter, chapter, well, chapter two in particular of that book, where they cover the basics of the field, but they also have a very nice compact segment on linear algebra and what you need. So that's actually a great thing to review. Um, we at least used to have a module on linear algebra that I recorded. It's like four one hour sessions. I think it's still on the website somewhere on the Viterbi website. I, sorry, I don't know the link, but um, that that's intended as a as a review of linear algebra for incoming students. Um, so that would be my number one. Um, if you come from a background where you don't you you haven't taken a quantum class, you might want to do some reading up on the basics of of that. So Nielsen and Schwang actually is a really good resource for that as well. EE five twenty uses that book as its textbook, so it's a really good place to start. Um, if you have a, taken a quantum class, still worth worth be, uh, taking a look at that because, as I said, uh, the way we do it is a little different than what's done in a standard quantum mechanics class in this field. Um, and then there are some other things that are helpful. Probability theory is helpful, um, but not as central as linear algebra. Um, uh, if you have, do some reading up on um, algorithms, uh, for, for, you know, that just sort of the basis of the idea of algorithms and, and computational complexity, that's a good thing to know as well. For someone coming with, say, like a physics background or a strong, you know, uh, quantitative skills, would it be potentially useful for them to take like a Python class? Yeah, 
I think it would. Um, if you haven't done any programming, well, shame on you. Um, but, uh, you know, programming is an awful lot of what everyone does. Um, so while most of the classes don't, well, Physics 513 certainly involves programming definitely. I mean, as part of the class, you have to write programs. But um, EE520 and 514 are more theoretical, but they do include projects that may involve programming as well. If you plan to go and do an internship or go and get a job in this field, you're going to need to know how to program. So, so if you if you don't have that, that would be a great thing to to work on over the summer. Get get some basic, uh, take some basic online class or or go through a, a book on programming in in one of the um, really common languages like. Python. If you already have a programming background and you want to kind of see what's out there, you can go look at IBM's. IBM has an absolutely fantastic website, which is guidance for people using their processors that are available through the cloud. Um, that's really a great thing to go and take a look at as well. Great. Okay, so we're kind of on the hour. So I just kind of like to welcome uh, Professor Brunn and Ingersoll to um, have any parting words of wisdom before we wrap up our, our session today. Uh, George? Hi. You're obviously the expert on the field, but it's uh, always exciting for me. Uh, this is one of the, the, the programs I'm always most excited to hear, hear about. It's such an exciting area um, for people to go into and so many possibilities. So yeah, no, I always enjoy hearing uh, the wisdom you have. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm really pleased that people are, are interested in this field and in this area. Um, if this is, you know, what you what really excites you, then I hope you'll can consider coming to USC and working with us. If you have any questions or anything uh, about the field or about the mechanics of the program or about USC, please do reach out to, to us. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Brunn and Dr. Ingersoll also for spending the time and, and sharing their wisdom. Um, so please, um, as um, Dr. Brunn said, uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and I'm just going to wish you all a great day and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks everyone.